Good morning, everyone. I presume some of you would have already implemented one of the uh, global food safety initiative, otherwise called GFSI schemes in your facility. This webinar will outline the common pitfalls you normally encounter in implementing the chosen GFSI standard in your organization and also avoid those pitfalls. Like any other webinar, the intent is to provide basic information on the topic to the attendees, thus helping you all to kindle the interest and explore the topic further. Well, my name is Rama and I'm the Technical Program Director for Perry Johnson Registrar Food Safety Certification, Inc. This is a certification body located in Troy, Michigan. We certify food companies and uh, uh, farms, agriculture farms to the various GFSI recognized food safety standards. And uh, as I mentioned to you in the previous slide, the intent is to kindle your interest in the topic and thus help you to explore it further. This webinar will not provide, I just want to make it clear, this, will, this is not going to provide any suggestion or step-by-step -step process for the implementation of the GFSI standards. This is just a general overview on the topic. Well, this is going to be the agenda. I have divided the contents of this webinar into three sections as shown on the slide. Section A will introduce you to the private food safety standards. I will explain the description private food safety standard. I'm sure you are familiar with the common GFSI standards such as uh, ESCF, BRC, and FSSC, etc. But I will have to repeat this for the benefit of others who are new to this type of certification and uh, who want to go for uh, GFSI certification in the near future. Section B, I will explain how to implement the chosen GFSI food safety standard as a project. So this is a project-based approach to implementing the chosen food safety standard. A project management approach to GFSI certification is ideal. This section will also explain how it can be achieved through the various phases of a project management process, such as uh, project initiation, project implementation, and project evaluation, finally project closure. Section C will outline the common footballs. In fact, this is the most important uh, section, actually, for this webinar will outline the common pitfalls in the implementation of the food safety management system. I'll explain what the common pitfalls normally we encounter in the implementation of the chosen standard from uh, uh, an auditor's perspective. This might help you in avoiding these traps in the successful implementation of the project. Now, Section A, I will introduce you to some of the common food safety standards. Well, consumers all over the globe are increasingly concerned about food safety. Food safety is a shared responsibility of producers, processors, distributors, retailers, regulatory bodies, and consumers. The concept is easy to understand. However, there are a number of variables in the chain. This is called food, food chain. You all know that. And uh, there are a lot of variables in the chain, food chain, that can affect the safety of food. Consumers are increasingly concerned about the farm practices, such as use of antibiotics and growth hormones in livestock, pesticide residues in crops and animals, also bacteriological contamination in raw materials and finished food products, poor hygiene, animal diseases, food additives, preservatives, etc., etc. Private certification schemes are formal documented systems that are administered by private sector, by the private sector. <clears throat> These certification schemes prescribe methods to obtain specific objectives and methods also, typically these things involve audits and certification. 
Private certification schemes are generally incorporate, incorporated into the supply chain contract where it becomes a contractual commitment. The uh, main drivers are the main driver of food, uh, private food safety certification schemes is the market force, the market demands it. Uh, if you are not certified, then your product is not going to be accepted by your customers. By <clears throat> implementing certification schemes, companies will be able to manage their food safety standards, rather food, specifically they will be able to manage their food safety hazards. They will be able to lower uh, their cost of production and also address the regulatory requirements basically to reduce liability and retain consumer loyalty. As a matter of fact, uh, it's quite unlikely private certification schemes will ever replace regulatory standards for obvious reasons because regulatory standard is totally different from private uh, one is for business, the other one is to make sure the public health is protected. Regulatory standards, in fact, uh, uh, they try to protect the public health, whereas uh, private food safety certification schemes, of course, they also have the objective of uh, uh, protecting public health, but at the same time, that is also a business uh, objective. Okay, there is also a business objective. Now this has been repeated a number of times and you are already familiar with these things but again I'm just going to take you through the benefits of third party certification. Third party certification provides compliance with government requirements. Third party certification also has the benefit of transparency and aims at continuous improvement and flexibility in the system. Okay. One major benefit to the industry uh, of implementing third-party certification schemes on the GFS side is the avoidance of duplication driven by the GFSI uh, goal. Basically, GFSI has a goal that states one certified accepted everywhere. This is called harmonization of standards. Okay. Certification to GFSI benchmark standards provides substantial economic benefits through avoidance of duplication of points. I'm not sure how familiar you are with GFSA certification for the benefits of those who have uh, no idea about GFSA certification. Here is the thing. The Global Food Safety Initiative is a result of collaboration between some of the world's uh, uh, leading food safety experts from retailers, manufacturers, and food service companies, as well as service providers active in the food supply chain. GFSI has got some objectives. So these are the objectives. Number one, to reduce food safety risks by delivering equivalents. This is called harmonization and convergence between effective food safety management system, systems, actually. There are a number of standards. GFSA has got the objective of harmonizing these standards. The second objective is to manage costs in the global food safety system by eliminating redundancy and improving operational efficiency. We just saw that in the previous slide. Okay. And also, develop competencies and capacity building in food safety to create consistent, effective global uh, food systems. Basically, this is uh, uh, improving the competency of those people who do audits and inspections. And finally, GFSA has got uh, another objective that is to provide a unique international stakeholder platform for collaboration, knowledge exchange, and networking. So these are the four objectives of uh, GFSI. Prior to the creation of GFSI in 2000, there was a proliferation of demands for audits. And everybody, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that uh, 
prior to 2000, uh, there were a number of food safety standards and uh, uh, companies were auditing, rather companies were audited by other third party agencies using these standards. And different retailers often applied specific food safety requirements for particular products uh, and suppliers were obliged to provide evidence through a number of audit. Almost every week, every month, every uh, 15 days, all these companies were audited actually by different companies. So there was proliferation of uh, uh, these standards prior to 2000, year 2000. Now GFSI, this slide shows two different schemes actually. Okay, GFSI recognizes two ISO standards for accreditation purposes. Both are ISO, ISO based standards. ISO 17065, 17065 and ISO 17021. Obviously the second one is supplemented by ISO 22000. Both these standards contain similar requirements for auditing food safety companies, food, sorry, food processing companies. They both address issues of preventing conflict of interest, managing customer information, properly qualifying personnel, auditor calibration, and many other aspects involved with the certification process. Basically, this is a management system standard for the certification body. How to audit food processing companies, how to audit uh, other entities in the food supply chain to the various standards, actually, food safety management system standards. Both standards require the accreditation body to observe auditors in the field. Okay, it's on-site uh, assessment of uh, the auditors working for certification bodies. Anyway, let's not get into details, but uh, just make sure that you understand uh, there are two different types of schemes. One is 17065 based, the other one is 17021. And the food safety standards that are under 17065 are given there. SGIF, BRC, IFS, Global Gap. These are all under 17065. And uh, ISO 22000, which is not a GFSI benchmark standard, uh, and FSSA 22000. These two standards are under 17021. Let's quickly go through some of the uh, GFSI benchmark certification standards again. Uh, this is for the benefit of people, uh, uh, companies that have not been certified to the GFSI standards. Okay. The first one is ESCIF. The acronym ESCIF stands for safe quality food. In fact, I think this is not a standard. This is an industry code for food safety. This is a retailer based certification scheme owned by Food Marketing Institute USA. This is a vertically integrated scheme and the food safety system requirements for the various sectors such as production, processing, storage and distribution. Uh, they're all documented in one single code. The food safety categories are assigned based on the type of products manufactured. In fact, uh, there are three levels of certification, level one, level two, and level three. Level one is basically, uh, uh, it focuses on food safety fundamentals. Level two is on food safety and level three on food safety and food quality. Uh, in fact, I think this is uh, the revision number, current revision number is 7.2 and it is getting changed to 8 from next year. Probably uh, it will be implemented by, uh, by July next year. Okay, that's a plan. It's a two-stage audit. First document review and uh, the second stage is going to be facility audit. Okay? And the duration, audit duration is normally one day for document review and a uh, day and a half to two for facility audit.
Unlike the Escape Corps, the British Retail Consortium and the BRC stands, the acronym BRC stands for British Retail Consortium. This has different standards for different sectors of the food chain. One for the manufacturing sector, another one for packaging, packaging and packaging materials. The third one for storage and distribution and uh, also there is one for the agents and brokers. Okay. And I will provide the details of uh, the um, uh, food standard issue 7 here. This is a single stage audit where uh, first I think documentation and implementation of the documented procedures will be verified at the same time. Unlike uh, the SKF audits, here it's a single state audit and uh, during that audit both documentation and the uh, implementation of the documented procedures will be assessed at the same time. Normally the duration is uh, two days. Okay. Um, unfortunately because of lack of time I will not be able to explain the details of other standards. I said uh, we have different standards for different product categories or uh, different areas. One for food, the other one for packaging, the third one for storage and distribution and there is also another one for uh, agents and brokers. Now IFS. This one stands for International Feature Standard. This is a German standard. Uh, these are similar to BRC standards in respect of audit duration, food safety requirements, etc. I think it's, uh, these two standards are very similar. Okay. The IFS packaging standard, uh, this one, is quite new and uh, uh, in fact I think this was a Canadian standard and IFS bought the rights for the standard from Canada PAC, Canada PAC Secure. Uh, and as I mentioned to you, this is similar to BRC in many respects. This standard, Global GAP, GAP stands for Good Agriculture Practice. It's a farm assurance standard for produce such as vegetables and fruits produced at the farm level. There are different standards under the scheme. I think to be exact, there are about 23 standards within this scheme or standard with two different options, single producers and uh, multiple producers. The most popular standards are Integrated Farm Assurance Standard, otherwise known as IFA, IFA for fruits and vegetables, product safety standard, and there are a number of local GAPR uh, good agriculture practice standards. The one for North America is called uh, Local uh, Gap for North America. And uh, Global Gap is a business to business brand and it's not directly visible to consumers. So <clears throat> let's not get into detail because otherwise the focus of this webinar is going to be on the pitfalls uh, from an auditor's perspective. Now let me give some information about uh, the 17 or 21 schemes, uh, 17 or 21 standards. This is based on ISO quality management system, both ISO 22000 and FSSC 22000. And the uh, FSSC 22000 standard is owned and managed by the FSSC Foundation in the Netherlands. This is a Dutch standard. This is also a GFSI benchmark scheme focusing only on uh, food safety. Okay, again, when we talk about FSSC 22000 standard, this is a two-stage uh, audit. In stage one, an auditor will verify the preparedness for stage two and also documentation, verify the documentation. And in stage two, the effectiveness of implementation will be verified. The, uh, this standard 
is a non-prescriptive standard, unlike the ISO 17065 based standards. Okay. Uh, so that's the main difference between these two schemes, 17065 and uh, 17021. Now we move on to section B. Uh, here I will explain how you can successfully implement the chosen GFSI standard through project management tools and techniques. And as I said, I'm not going to spend much time, but uh, for the benefit of uh, uh, those people or those companies that are planning to implement one of the GFSI schemes, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is going to provide some useful information. So when an organization decides to implement one of the GFSI certification standards, there is often the inclination to just charge ahead and start doing something without taking into consideration the time aspects or the best approach for the company. So it's, it's really important to have sufficient knowledge of the chosen standard and also has some because HACCP is the backbone uh, of all these standards. Uh, that means you know, to understand both the theory of HACCP and the practicalities of implementation of the chosen GFSA standard. So therefore, if you're new to HACCP or to the food safety standard, you will want to read and gain an understanding of the entire process before planning your approach and also before your preparation uh, for implementing the standard. <clears throat> the first thing you need to consider is where you are now and where you would like to get in terms of food safety management. So you have chosen uh, SKF, you have chosen BRC for instance. Now you want to know how to implement but before you do that, before you implement, you should know where you are and then where you want to be. So that means this is, you're going to do uh, some kind of gap assessment. Okay? People call it pre-assessment, people call it gap analysis and things like that. <clears throat> the way to implement the HACCP principles and the chosen food safety management system standard uh, may at, at first it may seem obvious, particularly after an initial training course. You attend a training course, you come back and then you know it may look uh, very obvious to you but when you get into the implementation phase you actually uh, encounter a lot of problems. So that's why a project management approach is much uh, better and it's a prudent approach basically. Now this is uh, where the foundations are laid and it is important to take time uh, to ensure that uh, the appropriate people are identified and trained. Now we are uh, getting into the project management approach of implementing your food safety management system. Also you have to establish what support systems are already in place and what needs to be developed and you should also consider the most appropriate structure for your system. And you have to plan the entire project including realistic timetable for development and implementation of the uh, chosen food safety management system. The first thing to do is to consider what you are trying to achieve. The path you take to uh, a fully implemented food safety management system will then depend on where you are starting from and the maturity of your existing system. Obviously you're not going to start from zero level, okay? You will have something in place. So you need to consider the maturity of your system. Another way to consider is by way of uh, Deming's plan, do, check, act, otherwise known as uh, PDS cycle. Now here we talk about the project team awareness. Right? 
And uh, early involvement of senior management is really fundamental to the effective implementation of the food safety management uh, system. Real commitment, we talk about real senior management commitment, can only be achieved if there is complete understanding of what it takes to develop and maintain a food safety program and how the food safety management system fits into the strategic direction of the company. So this is, uh, this is really a senior management uh, related, uh, uh, I mean these are senior management related. Senior managers do need a basic understanding of the most likely food safety hazards and ways to control them. That means you need to train them on the basics of food safety management system. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, you will also have a food safety team leader. The food safety team leader will have a key role in the success of the uh, food safety management system. Uh, the leadership role of the food safety team leader is responsible for a few things. Number one, uh, obviously uh, uh, the team members have sufficient uh, knowledge and expertise in the chosen food safety standard. Okay? So that means uh, a bit of training is required uh, for the team members. Their individual, individual skills and attributes are taken into account. The team leader is supposed to uh, review the skills, individual skills and attributes so that uh, uh, their skills can properly be utilized in uh, developing and implementing the food safety management system. And uh, also the team works coherently you know, as a team and not, not a disintegrated one. So these are some of the responsibilities of uh, uh, the food safety team leader. Again, uh, a quick uh, uh, review of uh, gap analysis. Okay, it's really important to evaluate the resources and systems in place and compare uh, these things against the requirements to manage the chosen food safety management system before you actually put uh, put together a project plan. Okay, and this is going to include a review of the assessment of the current systems and uh, personal resources. So in order to plan uh, the pathway to an effective food safety program, it is important to consider two basic questions. What are they? What resources and systems need to be in place for FSMS, that is the food safety management system to work? Okay? Because you're trying to implement uh, a GFSI uh, food safety standard. So you should know what resources and systems are in place and what need to be in place for the uh, standard to work. What resources and systems do the organization currently have? This is A minus B is your gap. So basically this is nothing but your gap analysis. Okay. A third question, how will I get there? Basically you want to implement the system and this is the third question, how will I get there? <coughs> The most effective way of identifying the gaps is to carry out a baseline audit of current systems and procedures using auditors with expert knowledge of the standard and systems. Okay? It doesn't mean you should always make use of an auditor. You can also do it yourself if you are familiar with the uh, uh, chosen standard. Okay. Now we are in section C, here I am going to talk about, or rather I will take you through the common pitfalls in implementing the chosen food safety management system standard. The next two slides, I have categorized uh, the common pitfalls under some ten different headings. Okay. Uh, here it is management review, I'm sorry, management commitment, management review, document management, records keeping, specifications. What are the common pitfalls uh, in these areas? And this slide talks about the common pitfalls in prerequisite programs, HACCP plan, verification validation,
corrective action management and training. Now let us go through one by one. Management commitment. No one can deny the importance of senior management support for the successful implementation of the chosen food safety management system. And, and uh, the senior management, they provide the resources, be it human resource or financial resource. Senior management standing behind a food safety management program is really critical to the success of the initiative. When you are seeking senior management support, that means when, a food when the food safety team leader is seeking senior management support, he or she should be fully prepared with facts and figures as to why developing a robust food safety program will benefit your company because after all, the senior management is going to spend a lot of money on the implementation of the project. Okay. Your plan as a food safety team leader should include a detailed description of the entire program, including goals, benefits, cost savings, budgetary con considerations, and the assurance that the program will not compromise business operation because the senior management is responsible for business operation. So when you go and present your facts, you should make sure that the food safety system uh, will not compromise business operation. That is the first thing to look at. In addition, the comparison of what similar businesses are doing could also help the cause. Okay? You may quote the example from other uh, sources actually. Anything short of these items will compromise or rather they could compromise your ability to launch a successful food safety program. Okay? And uh, this will pave the way for a superficial support on the part of the senior management, management as opposed to real commitment. We are looking for real commitment from senior management. So if you're not fully prepared Yes, of course, they will provide the support that's going to be superficial. The superficial support is not going to, uh, it's not going to result in a robust food safety management system implementation. Okay. Unfortunately, a few food safety team leaders are not very good communicators. Okay. Communication is really important. While it is a business requirement in many organizations to get certified to one of the GFSA standards, failure to convince a senior management at an early stage or at the early stages of the project is the main reason for failing to implement an effective food safety management system. This is from an auditor perspective because I have audited uh, a number of facilities, so I encountered this many times actually. So that's why I just wanted to share this information with you. Many food processing companies across the, food, uh, across the globe, uh, they do integrate food safety objectives or food quality objectives into the business objectives. Okay? As a matter of fact, uh, uh, they should complement one another. In the present day world, you know food safety cannot be relegated and uh, any major food safety crisis will have uh, devastating, devastating impact on the very existence of the business itself. So what I'm trying to uh, communicate is, uh, you know, uh, when you come up with food safety objectives, they should not, uh, they should only complement the business objectives the senior management has already come up with. Okay. And uh, um, if food safety objectives are not given uh, adequate importance, then that's going to have a very bad impact on the very existence of the business itself. Uh, I can give you an example. It has been estimated that uh, a product recall for food safety reason will be to the tune of about uh, uh, 10 million by way of tangible and intangible 
cost, actually. So, uh, of course, I think uh, this is not well shown. There could be some variations, but uh, uh, a recall on an average will cost you about uh, uh, 10 million, both in terms of uh, tangible and intangible uh, cost. Okay. Another important factor is company culture. Okay. Company culture is also one of the key success factors. Company culture is always driven from the top. For a company to create a strong food safety culture, all employees need to know that senior management uh, views food safety as a key element in the way the organization conducts its entire business and that it has a major impact on how well it performs. So that's management uh, uh, commitment is all pervasive. So management commitment is required for everything and particularly more so for implementing food safety management system. Okay. Now let's see what uh, common pitfall, uh, pitfalls are there uh, in management review. We all know management review of the implemented food safety management system is a requirement. So review of uh, uh, the progress of the food safety management system is a requirement of uh, the GFSA standards. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I can tell you many food safety team leaders responsible for implementing food safety management system. They're not quite aware of the actual requirement. This is again from an auditor perspective. Okay. The reason why food safety management system standards require at least an annual review of the uh, implemented food safety management system is to ensure the senior management is made aware of the effectiveness of the food safety management system. This is done, this is normally done by reviewing the status of the policies and procedures, customer complaints, corrective action, internal, external audits, and any major changes effected in the food safety management system in the past. There is a distinct difference between an operational review and management review. Many a time, the food safety team leader of a company will produce documentation of the proceedings of an operational review meeting that are conducted either monthly or quarterly or in some companies you know, daily. But as an auditor, I can tell you that uh, uh, many food safety team leaders do not understand the difference between an operational review and management review. Um, so management review is not required to be conducted monthly or quarterly. The requirement is annual. But when you do that, you must include the items, the agendas I just uh, explained. You know, it should include internal external audits, review of customer complaints, review of corrective actions, and review of policies and procedures. Okay. Uh, so. When you conduct management review, please ensure that these items are included in your uh, management review. Another pitfall in management review is maintaining appropriate records. <clears throat> management review meetings should be preceded by an agenda forwarded to the management team. All meetings will have to have agenda, as you know. And then for management review also, you must circulate, you must forward an agenda well before the management review. Okay. It's quite important, it's absolutely important that the proceedings of management review meetings are documented adequately and comprehensively. As an auditor, I have come across management review records with, with very little detail as to what exactly was discussed in those meetings. It's not enough to say, yeah, we conducted management review meeting and then we address ABC items. No, that's not what is required. You should provide some details. Other, you should provide a lot of details in your uh, management review meetings for your management uh, 
meetings actually. There's a possibility that these records will provide valuable information at a later date in addition to meeting the requirements of the standard. So it's not only really, I think this could become a historical thing, probably after two years or after a year, if you would like to go back and then verify what happened during that time, this would provide some valuable information in addition to meeting the requirements of the chosen standard. Okay. And you will also have some action items as outputs from these meetings. And this is going to be followed uh, up by the uh, food safety team. Here. Now there are uh, some pitfalls associated with uh, document management. Documentation is one of the most difficult tasks to accomplish in the implementation of the food safety management system project. Documentation like any other management, documentation of food safety management system like any other management system standard follows a life cycle approach that is from the beginning to the end, or rather cradle to grave. That means establishing procedures for creating, approving, revising, and for making documents absolute. So this is what we call a life cycle approach to documentation. The uh, main pitfall in document management is not knowing what and how to document. Okay? It's not necessary that you need to describe procedures in the greatest detail possible. It can also be in the form of flowchart. Okay, it doesn't. You don't have to write stories. It can be simply a flowchart to describe uh, the whole process. Okay, they can also be either hard or soft copy. Obviously, the soft co copy is the preferred one these days because uh, uh, because of computerization. Yeah. As an auditor, I've seen many examples of poor documentation. It's a good practice to document. Uh, the following. Number one, each and every document should have a title. What is the title of the document? Date when this was created, revision number, name of approval authority because these things are required uh, by the food safety management system standard. Then the document should also explain the purpose of the actual purpose of the document. Okay. Then it should mention something about the scope of the document. It is applicable to so-and-so area. Okay. And then you actually describe the procedure. And if you have any associated form, if there are forms associated with this document, then you should make a reference to those forms as well. And you will also include a few references if applicable. And uh, if possible, you will also include revision history. It doesn't have to be in the same document. You can maintain it separately, but it's, it's a good practice to uh, document the revision history also in the same document. Okay. Again, uh, not maintaining appropriate documentation of points of use will result in audit findings. As, as a team leader, it is your responsibility to make sure that uh, documents are available uh, at the appropriate points of use. So if you're not going to maintain documentation at points of use, then that could result in audit findings. Not only that, you will have to make sure that the current documentation is available uh, at those points. Um, I have come across many lapses uh, in facilities I audited in the past. You know, basically not making, uh, not maintaining appropriate documentation at points of use. Again, it could be a good idea to organize documentation in four phase. Sorry, in four levels. Uh, level one, level two, level three, level four. Level one is your policies. Level two is your procedures. Level three is your construction. Level four, forms. I said it's it's a good practice. It's not a requirement. Okay.
Now let's talk about the common pitfalls in record keeping. Accurate record keeping is an essential part of a successful food safety management system. Okay? It's a requirement that all records must be kept as originals or true copies. So what is the definition of true copy? That is photocopies, pictures, scan copies, or other accurate re reproduction of originals. These are called true copies. I mean, you can maintain as hard copies, you can also maintain them in electronic format. All record entries must be accurately recorded in a permanent manner that can be read. This is a requirement. This is a requirement even from a regulatory perspective. For example, records cannot be recorded in pencils because they can be changed. So this is not permanent. That's why this is not acceptable. The information must be recorded at the time it is observed. In other words, it's not acceptable to walk out onto the production floor, observe practices, and then go back to an office to record the observation. No, this is not allowed even as per uh, regulatory requirements. Okay? If a facility decides to use electronic system or computerized record keeping system, the system should be validated. This is again a common pitfall. I've seen big companies making use of uh, uh, electronic record management system, but the system is not validated. Okay. So uh, there are some uh, specific uh, regulatory requirement which is not applicable to the food industry, but uh, uh, you know, 21 CFR Part 11 talks about electronic record management. Actually, so this is a CFR, and uh, um, and if you want to refer to this uh, standard, please do so. Again, as I mentioned, uh, this is not a requirement for uh, the uh, uh, GFSI standard. It's not a requirement of GFSI standard. Records must include basic information to provide a history of what happened. Okay? Basic information includes the name of the record, the name, and when necessary location of the facility, the date, and time that the activity was documented. There are so many things that need to be uh, made available on record. So um, again, this is from a regulatory perspective. Okay? If you are uh, implementing uh, uh, the preventive controls for human food regulation, then an inspector will definitely look for these items in uh, the records. Okay. Unfortunately, many companies do not pay enough attention to record keeping procedures and these, these things result in audit findings. The common pitfalls are not providing the basic information. I just mentioned a few actually. Not making uh, the records comprehensive and also altering records without approval. The second one is going to be viewed very seriously by, uh, by regulatory bodies. Okay. Procedures for altering records should be documented and all such changes should also be authorized. Okay. And retention of records must comply with legal or customer requirements. As a general rule, records must be kept for a period of at least shelf life of products plus one year. Now a few common pitfalls and specifications. The importance of uh, developing and implementing specifications in a food safety management system cannot be underestimated. Specifications provide not only the technical and food safety requirements of an ingredient or a raw material or a packaging material or a finished product, but are also legal or contractual uh, documents. I mean, this is a contractual requirement in many cases. All food safety management standards require documentation of specifications and uh, their periodic review. So these are some of the common pitfalls I have encountered as an auditor. Inadequate specification details pertaining to food safety. Also technical data sheets uh, versus specifications. I'll explain these things one by one. 
not having procedures for regular reviewer specifications, also not approving specifications or not getting specifications approved by customers. As I mentioned earlier, in many instances, specifications are contractual or legal documents. They must be detailed enough to include all food safety related parameters. Example, including aflatoxins in the specifications of corn flour or salmonella and pesticide residues and spices imported from other countries. Specifications can either be developed by the facilities procuring raw materials or ingredients or these facilities can simply adopt supplier specifications for these raw materials. Okay. However, there should be evidence that the supplier was adequately communicated about the food safety requirements of materials they buy. I have come across major pitfalls in the area of packaging material specifications. Okay. Uh, generally, I think when we ask for packaging material specifications, they produce a letter of guarantee, which is a record meaning it's, uh, you are just validating the specifications for that particular material. That is certificate of conformance, certificate of analysis, letter of guarantee. But specification is basically a document. You must or you should have uh, detailed and documented specifications for raw materials, ingredients, additives, packaging materials, etc., etc., including finished product. Again, let me just say something about technical data sheets. Technical data sheets are not true specifications. Many times facilities make use of them as specifications, which is incorrect. Okay? Technical, specific, technical data sheets do not provide the actual food safety uh, related requirement. They do, not, they do not have information about, sometimes they do not have information about uh, um, the uh, food safety requirements of a material. Basically, this is a technical data sheet is for marketing purposes. It's not a technical document. Another area that requires attention is not reviewing specifications for adequacy periodically because all these standards require uh, review of specifications. And some standards stipulate the uh, timeline also that, you know, for example, every three years uh, uh, facilities must review the specifications. Okay? And uh, this, is neglect this is also a neglected area in many companies. Okay? Now something about uh, prerequisite programs. Again, uh, uh, I've got another eight to ten minutes. I don't think I'll be able to explain the pitfalls in uh, uh, each and every prerequisite program, but I will quickly take you through the common pitfalls. Okay. As you all know, the food safety plan is not a standalone program, but uh, rather a part of a larger food safety system. The foundation programs that are part of the food safety system are frequently called or frequently termed the prerequisite programs. Okay. This is to indicate that these programs should be in place before hazard based uh, systems are implemented they are implemented in order to effectively manage the risks from uh, the identified hazards okay. people actually um, use the descriptions of PRPs, the prerequisite programs, GMPs, CGMPs, and things like that, or good hygiene practices, sanitation standard operating procedures. All these uh, terms of uh, descriptions are used interchangeably. So the important thing to remember is that these are foundational programs included in uh, the overall food safety system. Prerequisite programs are unique to facilities implementing the food safety management systems. And therefore, facilities must identify and document and also implement the relevant PRPs, the prerequisite programs, to control the hazards identified in their own food safety plan. In general, facilities identify and implement the prerequisite programs appropriate to their, to their area of operation. The most common pitfall is not documenting what hazard 
the PRP is going to control in their HACCP plan. No, the documentation of this is quite weak in many HACCP plans. That's what I have come across uh, as an auditor. The other pitfall is not adequately training the relevant staff on PRP. It's not just enough to document the PRP, but you have to make sure that uh, uh, people are trained appropriately on uh, these uh, PRPs. Okay? Now, let me quickly uh, explain the common pitfalls in the HACCP plan. Again, I'm going to make use of the 12 steps of Codex, Codex HACCP model. Okay, product description. The first thing is product description. And uh, understanding the basic information about a product and how it is distributed is intent, is really needed to determine if specific controls are important to ensure the safety of the product. Okay. And in fact, throughout the distribution cycle. Many times, food safety teams and a few companies do not include the relevant information in product description, uh, such as uh, food safety characteristics, storage and distribution requirements, <clears throat> and other important information pertaining to food safety hazards. So these are, uh, these things generally Get, they're not included, I'm sorry, these are not included uh, in the product description uh, document. Now the next one is uh, describing the intended use and consumers of the food. Okay? Generally when you uh, describe the intended use, the team leader should consider or the team should consider these questions. So what is the intended use of the product? What is the potential for mishandling and, and intended use? What handling and preparation procedures are required of the end users? Okay. Who are intended consumers of the product? Is a product intended specifically for use by immunocompromised individuals or other susceptible groups? So these questions, I think, before you actually uh, uh, come up with a detailed plan, these questions should arise, but unfortunately, uh, um, unfortunately, people do not get into this much detail. Now, developing the flow diagram, that's another uh, uh, step in the, uh, in the codex model. Okay. Some of the most common pitfalls are uh, uh, not aligning the flow diagram with the actual flow on the floor, meaning they don't match. The document doesn't match with uh, the actual thing on the floor. And uh, many times the food safety team does not physically verify the flow diagram actually. So these are some of the common footballs. And I'm going to spend a few minutes, uh, yeah, probably another five minutes. I'm sorry, I think uh, it's going to be another five, ten minutes uh, after 12 o'clock if you're okay with that. Okay. This is about hazard analysis. This is extremely important in the sense um, again, this is the backbone of uh, any HACCP plan. Any biological, chemical, or physical agent that has the potential to, what is the definition of hazard? This is any potential, sorry, any biological, chemical, or physical agent that has the potential to cause illness or injury. Okay. Um, this is, in fact, uh, a major area of concern for food safety auditors. Facilities do not identify the potential hazards associated with raw materials, ingredients, or packaging materials. Okay? And many HACCP plans do not even include raw material hazard analysis. Okay? Just receiving raw materials, just one box that says you know, receiving raw materials. But you all know hazards are very specific to raw materials. If you do not identify potential hazards associated with raw materials, you may not be able to control the risks. Okay. Another area of concern is not providing adequate justification in the HACCP plan for CCPs. It's not, example, it's not enough to just identify metal detection as a CCP. You should also provide justification for CCPs and other CCP limits. 
Oftentimes, food safety team does not provide adequate evidence for review of HACCP plans. Reviewing HACCP plan is also a requirement of, uh, um, of the GFSA standards. Okay. Verification and validation. Verification is an essential part of a food safety plan. It confirms that the food safety plan is operating as intended, whereas validation confirms the effectiveness of the food, food safety plan. It, the food safety plan is actually controlling the food safety hazard. So this is the difference between verification and uh, validation. Um, unfortunately, the intent of this webinar is to not go through the details of the uh, individual verification and validation procedures, but uh, in a nutshell I can tell you quite often uh, food safety team is confused with the definitions and details of verification and validation. They may not know how to verify the various PRPs for effectiveness. Okay? And uh, uh, you may have uh, a verification schedule, but the verification schedule is not quite detailed. A verification, a verification schedule should actually uh, provide some information about what is being verified, who is going to verify, at what frequency, and using what method. So details are lacking. Such details are lacking in the verification schedule many times. Corrective action uh, related pitfalls. You all know the difference between correction and corrective action. Correction is a short-term solution, whereas corrective action is a long-term solution. You may not be able to implement corrective action without doing root cause analysis. The main pitfall here is not understanding the difference between correction and corrective action. All the GFSA standards require, at least for major non-conformities, uh, and to some extent, uh, uh, minor nonconformities, correctives action is required. Correct. If you do not do proper root cause analysis, you may not be able to implement an effective uh, corrective action. So this, this is in fact the major pitfall as far as uh, corrective action management system is concerned. Okay. And uh, lastly, training. Again, here also we uh, follow a life cycle approach. That means identifying the training needs, providing training, and uh, uh, assessing the effectiveness of training. This is what I call a life cycle approach to training. Okay? In many companies, people do not have documented training needs analysis. Obviously, training costs money, but uh, you, should, you should have a procedure for identifying training needs. Uh, then when you provide training, after providing training, you must uh, document how the trainee was actually assessed for the uh, training effectiveness. So these are some of the common pitfalls uh, in training. Um, I know I just, uh, you know, it's shallow fine. I mean, I'm through with the presentation. If you have any specific questions, please do so. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.